Thank you, Joyce. When I was in college, I had a professor whose name was Dr. Carson, and Dr. Carson was an interesting fellow on a variety of different levels. Um, one of the reasons that he was interesting, among other things, is that he was blind and um, had been blind since birth, and it was amazing to me how his blindness uh, for, and most of the time was, was hardly a handicap at all for him. Though It amazed me how easily he could navigate campus and, would, and never disoriented and going up and st- upstairs, downstairs, everywhere in all these buildings and just did so with, with Justice Kane without assistance. It was just amazing to me that he could do that. Uh, in class, it was amazing to me how, uh, without sight, though, and, and, and to this day, I still don't quite f- understand this, he could tell if somebody had their head down on their desk. I, I, I honestly don't know, and he never caught me with that, but I, I, I could never tell how it was that Dr. Carson could identify that somebody did, was not, you know, having their head up and paying attention. Anyway... But he, uh, there were no problems at all with him being able to, ha- to have dialogue in class with students and to lecture and to do all this stuff. And so that, that was pretty interesting about him. It was also interesting about him that he had all sorts of unusual phrases. And uh, for one thing, he called himself the wheel. And like he would be in class and, and I don't know, he would be lecturing. And then he would spin around and clap. I don't know why. Because he's the wheel and wheels spin around, I guess. And so, uh, but if you didn't turn in a... An assignment, uh, if you were to get a zero on it, you didn't get a zero, you'd get a zippy poo. You got a D on a test, you went to Dandyville. You got an F, you went to Flunktown. And so it was all these unusual expressions that he would use. Anyway, I had Dr. Carson uh, for New Testament when I was at Gardner Webb, finished uh, college, went on to seminary, and Dr. Carson wound up joining the faculty at Southeastern Seminary. And as uh, he joined the faculty, he uh, was teaching in the undergraduate program. And um, because of that, I didn't have any classes with him there. However, uh, I, I did get to experience him, him generally at least three times a week because we had chapel service, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, about 10 o'clock. Everything else shuts down on campus. And so from 10 to 11, there's, there's chapel service. And you always knew when Dr. Carson was there because he was what I would describe as a vocal listener. A very vocal listener. And so, like, I mean, you would hear amens and that type of thing, and Dr. Carson would do something like that, but he would use other expressions that I never heard anybody else use. And so, uh, for example, sometimes a, a preacher's talking and they may ask a rhetorical question. So, do we want to be defeated by Satan? Of course, I mean, that's a rhetorical question. But Dr. Carson always answered rhetorical questions. If they were negative, you'd hear him go, no, no, or just really loud. If he heard something that he liked, he might say amen, or he may say this, hit me, hit me. So if you're feeling it today, and you say hit me, we won't think that you need another card. Anyway, but he would say hit me. Something else he would say if it was a particularly notable idea, at least as deemed by Dr. Carson, he would say this, that's the point. That's the point. And sometimes he may string them together. That's the point. Hit me. (laughs) But he would say, that's the point. You know, sometimes it's almost as if we need that clarifying statement. Oh, that's the point. Because sometimes, just in the living of life, we get stuck in the weeds. We get mired in the muck, trapped in the detail, and we lose sight of what really we should be focused on. Now, on a spiritual level, that is something also that it is possible for us to lose sight of. And by that, I mean this. We operate as people in a culture that is aware, by and large, of Jesus. But if you listen to the news media or you listen to expressions from popular culture, it's pretty clear that our culture and our society has no idea what it is that Jesus is about. Jesus in our society is a, is, is, is a teddy bear. Jesus in our culture is a, um, just a, a good, nice, honest affirming 
give you big hugs. That, 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 that's what Jesus is about. And honestly, over time, it's very easy for us as, as those who operate as a part of this culture to get to the point where we kind of think maybe that's the point of Jesus. That Jesus, the point of his ministry, the point of Jesus coming into the world was to be a good example, to be loving, to, be, uh, to, to show attention and grace and kindness towards those who are outcasts, to, to raise up the afflicted. And, and th that's what Jesus is about. Or even sometimes just without thinking about it uh, and, and giving some intentional thought to it, even as people who say and truly are actual followers of Jesus, sometimes it is we can get to the point where we lose sight of what he came for and what Jesus is about. So what's the point? What's the point of Jesus coming into the world? What's the point of what Jesus does? The writer of Hebrews answers that question. We see that today in Hebrews chapter 8. If you would look with me there in your Bibles, Hebrews chapter 8. As you're turning there, let me just uh, share with you a plug for a series that begins next Sunday. I'm calling it The Bible, The Birds, and The Bees. And I hate to disappoint you, but it is not a video-driven series. And so, uh, but one of the things that you're aware of is as it relates to sexual morality... You and I, as followers of Jesus, are being inundated with perspectives, opinions, and convictions that are at odds with what God has said. And we need to know what God has said about all of these issues, candidly hot-button issues that we are experiencing today. So that I, I hope that you will be here uh, next week and as the, the series continues to unfold, the Bible, the birds, and the bees starting next Sunday. All right, Hebrews chapter 8, join me in verse 1. There we're told this. Now the main point... That's a pretty good indicator that we're getting a synopsis, that, that we're, we're drawing focus on something that's important. The main point of what is being said is this. We have this kind of high priest who sat down at the right hand of the throne of the majesty in the heavens, a minister of the sanctuary in the true tabernacle that was set up by the Lord and not man. For every high priest is appointed to offer gifts and sacrifices. Therefore, it was necessary for this priest also to have something to offer. But if he were... On earth, he wouldn't be a priest, since there are those offering the gifts prescribed by the law. These serve as a copy and shadow of the heavenly things, as Moses was warned when he was about to complete the tabernacle. For God said, Be careful that you make everything according to the pattern that was shown to you on the mountain. But Jesus has now obtained a superior ministry, and to that degree, he is the mediator of a better covenant, which has been established on better promises." There's a ton to unpack in this passage. And let me just go ahead and tell you at the outset, we're not going to be able to unpack all of it. But what I will say is this. God uses the writer of Hebrews to communicate the point of Jesus. Why did he come? What is it that he's about? And based on what he says in this passage, a few things are clear. And the first is this. Jesus has done what you do not need to Jesus has done what you do not need to. So verse 1 begins with that statement that the main point of what is being said is this. And then he goes on to say, and he's talking clearly about Jesus, that we have, and he's describing Jesus as a kind of high priest, and of Jesus he says a couple of things are true. He says that he sat down at the right hand of the throne of majesty in the heavens. So he's, he's saying to us, first of all, where it is that Jesus is operating now. That he is with the Father, but he is seated to his right hand. The, the first thing I'd have you notice, because it's not, I don't believe at all, accidental, that the position of Jesus, he is described as being at the Father's right hand. Now, we might not be aware of this, or culturally and because of our religious traditions, we're not aware of this, but the first, this first century Jewish Christian audience, these words were not lost on them because they were familiar with a group known as the Sanhedrin. Now, you're aware that the people of God in the area known as Israel, by the time you're in the first century, it's not Israel anymore. It's part of the Roman Empire. 
That being said, the, the, the people of God long to be their own nation, to, be, uh, to maintain their own sovereignty, but they're under the thumb of Rome. That being said, Rome was able and did grant them some levity so that they could have some sense of, and to a limited degree, some self-rule. And one of the, the ways in which the people of God ruled themselves was through a group of 70 elders known as the Sanhedrin. And so the Sanhedrin, again, they weren't given carte blanche by the Romans, but they were granted a fair amount of levity to, to settle all sorts of disputes within the Jewish community and even to assess penalties and punishments for violations, not of Roman law, but of Mosaic law, rules that God had given. And so when, when the Sanhedrin would meet, when this council of 70 would meet, there would be a presiding judge. And on either side of the presiding judge, there was a recording secretary. The recording secretary to the left recorded judgments. The secretary to the right recorded acquittals. Now, this audience would have known about that and so when they when they hear when they read this phrase of Jesus that he is seated next to the throne of the majesty in heaven so he's Jesus is seated next to the father where is he he's to the right he is on on the position that they knew that's where acquittals are based but it's not just simply that he's saying that Jesus positionally is beside the father to the right but beyond that he says of Jesus that he is seated now when you sit the clear implication is that whatever you were doing the work that you were being busy about if you had been up and moving about when you sit down that suggests what that the work is done that the task has been accomplished and repeatedly throughout this letter that we know as Hebrews the, the writer is being used by God to reference all kinds of stuff that these Jewish believers were aware of and being mindful of the fact that going back to the days of Moses that God had established this system where there were priests and then there was a high priest and regularly there was sacrifice after sacrifice after sacrifice that had to be offered and so if, if you had sinned well, a sacrifice had to be offered to deal with that sin. And so you would go to see the priest and an animal's life would be shed, taken, and blood would be spilt so that your sins could be atoned for. Well, if, if you stumped your toe on the way home and said something that you shouldn't, well, you sinned again. The, another sacrifice has to be offered. And so the, the Old Testament is a wash in a sea of blood where sacrifices have to be offered again and again and again and again and again over and over and over and over again. It was a constant cycle of continuous work. There are at least a couple of appliances in our home that you do not want to be. If somehow you were to wind up being an appliance you don't want to be either a washing machine or a dishwasher in our house because if you are I promise you you will be worked to death and we do I mean, we've got a big family and so we've got a lot of dirty clothes and so the washing machine I think just stays in on dishwasher is about the same thing and we wash dishes and run the dishwasher almost without exception every single day and because we're, we're eating at home, we're using a lot of dishes, and so the dishwasher's getting run all the time. That being said, I'm sure this has never happened to you, but it's happened to us on more than a few occasions. So, and it's typically me who does this, but let's say I have been in the kitchen, and I see that there are a few dirty dishes in the sink. I will go open the dishwasher, and I will put them in, and it looks like the dishwasher is full, so I'll put some soap in it and go ahead and start it. A few minutes later, Caroline comes into the kitchen to hear the dishwasher and says why did you start the dishwasher those were clean dishes <laughs> that, does, that, that doesn't happen at your house yeah I didn't think so anyway but d dumb me keeps washing clean dishes but, but when, she, when she says that to me the, the point is, is simple the, the dishes are already clean it has already been taken care of so you don't have to do it 
when the writer of Hebrews says of Jesus, and he's saying this is the main point. Jesus has done what you do not need to, in that Jesus has given the sacrifice to deal with your sins so that there is nothing else that needs to be done. In fact, the work can be described as so completed that he is now seated. He is seated next to the Father because the work has been accomplished. And so he did what you do not need to. Our, our sin has separated us from God. It, it means that, that we, when we, because of our sin, we don't have a relationship with God. It means that one day we're not going to be with him unless and until the sin gets dealt with. Sin requires a sacrifice, and the sacrifice is either going to be you or it was going to be Jesus. And the writer of Hebrews' point is this. Jesus took your place. And so he has done what you do not need to. And so in terms of application, quit acting like there is anything other than leaning on what he did that makes you right with God. Now, society, our culture gets lost in the muck. I mean, there's just enough that they know about Christianity or about Jesus that they have this concept, but they completely miss the point. The point of Jesus coming is this. He came to do what you don't now have to. Jesus has done what you don't need to. But beyond that, the writer of Hebrews communicates that Jesus makes possible what you never could. He makes possible what you never could. There is a ton to be able to unpack in verses 2 through 5, but I want you to just drop down with me to verse 6, where we're told of Jesus that he has now obtained a superior ministry, and to that degree he is the mediator of a better covenant. So he says of Jesus that he is, has this ministry. He says, has now obtained. Note, and you can see it even in English, in clear, uh, as clear as day in Greek, but th this is a present tense statement. So it, it means that there is an action that has occurred in the past whose action continues until this very moment. So just a moment ago, we described how what Jesus did there, there's nothing more that needs to be done. He is now seated next to the Father. And so there is very much this sense in which Jesus is done. And that's a true statement, but it's also in some ways a false statement because it's not like Jesus is seated now next to the Father kind of twiddling his thumbs. The, the sacrifice has been made. There's no additional offerings that have to be given but Jesus has a ministry that continues, and it's described here in verse 6 as being the, the mediator of a better covenant. He's the mediator of a better covenant. What does that mean for Jesus to be a mediator? Though um, I have a hairline that is very similar to Dr. Phil, that's about all that we share in common. That being said, as part of my responsibilities and opportunities as a pastor, one of the things that, that over the years I've had to do, not a ton of, but I've had to, uh, as the need has arisen, is, is to help couples when their marriages are on the rocks. And they come to me, and unfortunately sometimes they come to me almost when it's too late, when they're, I mean, getting ready to load the gun to shoot the other is about the time that they will come to see me. But over the years it's, it's, it's happened where You've got a couple that gets at odds with each other, and it continues over time. And they get to a point and place where all they can do is argue. I mean, you can't even mention the weather without somehow them being at odds with each other. And when, when they come to me and describe and, and paint the picture for what the, the difficulties are looking like, one of the things that I will say to them is this. All right, we're scheduled time. We're going to meet next week. But if there is a, an issue this week, there's one today, there's a problem going home, I want you just to remember it. Don't talk about it. Don't, don't, don't try to work through it. Just, just remember, if necessary, write it down. And when we meet next week, at that point, I want you to talk about this with your spouse in front of me. And I want you to do this in front of me, not because I am a magician or because I've got uh, just a, a magic wand in my tool belt that I can wave on your circumstance. Rather, I, I'm saying this. 
it is pretty clear that you have gotten to a point and place where there is no way that you can even communicate with each other without getting at odds with each other. And so what you need is someone to help remind you of what the strike zone is and to help you converse with each other in ways that don't bring about increased hostility. What, what you need is, not because of, of special skills that I bring to the table, what you need is a mediator. Because that's, that's what a mediator does, isn't it? It's, it's, it's an individual who takes two parties that are at odds with each other and helps them through various means to work through it so that parties who were at odds get okay with each other. And what does the writer of Hebrews say about Jesus? It says of Jesus that he is the mediator for us. And so what he's trying to communicate is this, this idea reminding us of this fact that when you and I came into this world, we came into this world, Paul says that we came into this world as sinners. I mean, from birth, we come into this world separated from God. And it's not that over time we get closer. In many ways, it's as if we get further and further away because the, the older we get, the more that we learn, the more it is that we continue to color outside the bounds of the, of the rules that God has established. And so we are at odds with God, and we cannot fix this. That There's nothing that we can say that makes this better. There's nothing that we, that we on our own can do that, that somehow fixes this. We are at odds with the one who has made us, and we need what? We need a mediator. And the writer of Hebrews says of Jesus that he is the mediator of a better covenant. What's interesting is that the word that is used of Jesus that's translated as mediator in the New Testament is used two ways. And sometimes it's used to convey, and I believe this is an instance where it's used to convey two meanings. When it describes Jesus as a mediator, that talks about one that, that helps disparate parties get okay with each other. But it's also a term used to describe someone who serves as the guarantor of a contract. Almost like a co-signer. So, so here's the thought. The writer of Hebrews is saying of Jesus, the point of his coming not only is to do for you what you don't need to do for yourself, but to make possible what you could never on your own make possible, which was to get okay with the one who made you. And not only does he mediate you and I and our relationship with God, but he also serves as the guarantee of, the surety of, the fact that we are okay and that we will remain okay with him. Was he a great teacher? Sure he was a great teacher. Was he a tremendous example? Sure he was. But that's not the point of his coming. The point is that he's come to do what you don't need to. That he makes possible what you never could. But finally he communicates this. That Jesus made reality what you could have only hoped for. That Jesus made reality what you could have only hoped for. If you're familiar with the, the book of Hebrews... Uh, one of the things that, that hopefully you're aware of, and if you ever want to understand this, this book of the New Testament, you have to keep in mind context. So here it, it is written to Hebrews. So these are Jews, but specifically they are Jews who have come to faith in Christ. Because they have come to Jesus in faith, they are now Jewish Christians, and that puts them in a terrible cultural position because their Jewish community views them as turncoats. What do you mean? This, I mean we, we have gone on record to show what we think about Jesus. We nailed him to a cross, and you want to align yourself with him? What's the matter with you? We don't even want to do business with you. You can't buy our stuff. We won't sell things to you. We won't buy your goods. We don't want you in our neighborhood. So they're catching heat from their own community, and sometimes even their own family, completely cut off. But besides that, they have aligned themselves and connected themselves with Jesus. And because of that, they're aligning with someone who was deemed by Rome as an insurrectionist. So the, 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 the Roman Empire doesn't like them because they're Christians associated with Jesus. 
the Jewish community can't stand them because they are associated with Jesus. And so the temptation is, you know, I can't just throw my hands up. I've got to do something. And so maybe, just maybe what I can do is to just walk away from Jesus and maybe at least go back to formal Judaism. So maybe my own people will like me again. And so one of the things that you see as this letter unfolds is that God uses the writer of Hebrews to describe how Jesus is superior to any and everything. He describes how Jesus is superior to the angels, how he is superior to the prophets, how he is superior to Moses, how he is superior to any and everything. Why in the world would you want to go back to something that is, by comparison, inferior? And it's based on that continuing thought that you go back to verse 6 where he says of Jesus that he is the mediator of a better covenant which has been established on better promises. So what in the world does that mean? We have to ask yourself, well, what's, what's a covenant? Well, a covenant in its simplest terms is, is ultimately an agreement. It's a binding agreement between two parties. Now, if, if you go reverse back to the earliest days of the Old Testament, you see God establishing a covenant with what became known as the Israelites. And the covenant was pretty simple. I will be your God, you will be my people. I will reveal myself to you to you, and through you so that you might be, for me, a light unto the world. So th- that, that, was, that was the covenant. But it was a covenant, it was an agreement where God had a relationship with people, but it was not just a relationship on any old terms. God established some boundaries for it. And so we know, for example, God gave the law through Moses. So th- these are the boundaries. These are the, the ways in which, as part of this covenant, God expects you to operate. And in short, throughout the whole of the Old Testament, we, we have this covenant that has been established where God has erected boundaries. And as he's erected boundaries, he's also provided a solution So that when the boundaries are crossed, when they have disobeyed, that there's some sort of remedy for that. And so the the remedy was that when these trespasses occur, that a sacrifice would have to be offered. And so there was this this sacrificial system involving the blood of animals and the, the use of priests and high priests. Now, in the mind of God, this was never to be the ultimate solution. Instead, it was but a shadow of the things to come. In fact, you see that... In verse 5, the writer of Hebrews uses the phrase that these things are a copy and a shadow of the heavenly things. This was never to be the the ultimate solution. And so the, the ultimate solution was to establish not simply another covenant, but a better covenant that's established on better promises. And the better covenant was this, that Jesus came and offered his life once and once for all And it was sufficient to deal with the sin of man from that point forward. That's not just a covenant. That's a better covenant. I remember when I was little, the first camera that I ever got. I I don't know if I found it in the attic or in an old junk drawer of my parents. But I, I found this camera that used to belong to them that they said, yeah, you can have that. It was an old Kodak 126 camera. Do you remember 126s? Um... I mean, you're, you're familiar in terms of film with 35 millimeter, but uh, 126 came out, and I think that might have been the first cartridge film. And I don't know, for those of you that don't remember or don't know what I'm talking about, you had this plastic cartridge that on one side there would be film that's kind of going through this to, to the other side, and you just plop it into the camera, press the, the shutter button, and then advance it, and you're ready for another picture. And so you can get a roll that had, you know, 12, 18, 24, 36 pictures on it. And so it was pretty cool. Very simple. It didn't have a zoom lens on it. It was just this fixed lens, a little small camera. And I, I was super excited. I, I remember very clearly the day that I got this. I couldn't wait to get to Kmart to buy some film to put in this camera so I could take pictures of my dog. And so um, anyway, th- that was my first camera. Now, on this camera... It did not, if, 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 if it was dark, there was going to be a problem because you need some light. It did not have a flash on it, but it did have a way for you to use a flash. And what you would have to buy were flash cubes. You remember those? 
So you had this little square, and it had a total of four flashes on it. And so when you snap one of those on, when you press the, the shutter, one of those flashes fires, and then it goes, and it goes to the next one. Do you know why? Because it couldn't be used again. Now, fast forward a few years later, I got for Christmas, I think I was in the fifth grade, it was the Keystone XR308 110 camera. I remember that vividly because I asked for it for months. But it was a 110 camera. And you know what it had? A built-in flash. So that in any scene, and every scene that there was darkness, there would be light. Not just once, but every single time. Now between the two, there's clearly one that's better. The, the, that first camera, it flashes once. You need more light? You, you got to do it again. And again, and again, and again, and again. The writer of Hebrews is saying, listen, that, that, that's what it would have been like absent Jesus. Because the only way to deal with our sin problem is that a sacrifice has to be offered. And, and, the, and throughout, throughout the whole of the Old Testament, this, it is scripture, a, a, a wash in a sea of blood of animal after animal after animal, sacrifice after sacrifice after sacrifice, because every time it covered just that. And when, when there was more darkness, you had to get another light and another light and another light and another light and another light. And he says of Jesus Listen, this is a, an entirely better covenant because it is one and done. And that everywhere there is darkness, light is there. It's not just a sacrifice, it is a better sacrifice. It's not just a covenant, it is a better covenant. In fact, beyond that, it's established on better promises. When God established a covenant relationship with the people of God in the Old Testament, it was, I will be your God and you will be my people. As part of that covenant, the Lord established some promises. And he said for them, or to them, among other things, that they would not perish from the earth, that they would be as numerous as the grains of sand on the beach. Those, those aren't bad promises. In fact, those are really good promises. But consider the promises that come because of the new covenant in Jesus. I will never leave you or forsake you. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go to prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am, there you may be also. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. That you are sons of God through faith in Jesus. Behold what manner of love the Father has bestowed on us that we are children of God. Listen, those aren't just promises. They are entirely better promises. What I'm trying to say is this, that Jesus made a reality what we could have only dreamt of. Back in the days of Moses, back in the days of all the saints of the Old Testament, Day in, day out, it was another sacrifice, another offering, another atonement has to be made. The fact that there could be a once and for all sacrifice, they could only dream of it. But Jesus made it a reality. Listen, was Jesus a great teacher? Sure he was. Did Jesus show love and compassion? Absolutely he did. Was he uh, an encourager? Was he a corrector? Was he all of the... Yes, he, he was those. But so easily, we can get stuck in the weeds, trapped in the mire, and losing sight of what ultimately matters. What's the point of him coming? Our culture doesn't understand it, but the Lord has made it clear that Jesus has done what you don't need to. That Jesus makes possible what you never could and that he makes a reality what we could only dream of. That's the point. Will you bow your heads with me? If indeed that's the point, what do you do with it? More importantly, my question is this, what have you done with it? It is entirely possible that being here or in some church on any and every Sunday is part of your routine. You may have a Bible with your name on it. 
maybe that you've held for years. You've written in it. You've underlined and highlighted. Your name's on a Sunday school roll. You have a fish sticker on the back of your car. But it is entirely possible, entirely possible, that somehow you've missed the point. And that God has used something today, that he's used the truth of his word, that he is using the power of the Holy Spirit to show you, yeah, I, if, if that's the point, I, I haven't done anything with that. I've been leaning on me and me doing stuff. When truth, I, I can't solve this problem on my own. And my only response is to, by faith, lean on and lean into him for what he's done for me. Listen, if that's you, even if you have been connected with this or some other church for decades, there is no shame in saying, you know what, somehow I missed it. But I don't want to miss it any longer. I want to experience Jesus in a way that will change everything. If that's you, in just a moment, we're going to have a time of decision. And I invite you, will you just step out from where you are and allow me to, to begin a conversation with you? We can talk more afterwards. Or if you're petrified of that, please see me afterwards and say, Michael, can, can I talk to you for a moment? Because what we've talked about this morning, that, that's the point of everything that we do. Nothing else by comparison matters. Maybe you're here today, though, and you say, well, Michael, I... I I mean, I appreciate the refresher course. I can't say that we plowed any new ground today, but you know what it has done is to peel a few scales off and to help me realize just how wonderful it is what Jesus has done for me. And I just need to say to him, thank you, but beyond that, to make the decision that this week I want to live in ways that indicate that I'm grateful. Among other things, I want to live in ways that point people to him, to the point of why it was that he came. Maybe there's some other burden you came into this place with today, but you don't want to leave with it. Listen, this is your opportunity. Father, we are grateful that you speak to us, and you speak to us through a variety of different ways. And God, it could be something in a song. It could have been something in a message. It could be through your word. It could be through your spirit. But in a variety of different ways, you have sought to communicate to us where we are and where we could be for specific things that you are inviting us to change, I pray that we realize you are extending the invitation and that we respond positively, not to me, but to you. We commit this time of decision to you in Jesus' name. Amen. I'm going to ask if you would to stand as our praise team leads us. In